Father, we, we confess to you, Lord God, that you are worthy. And uh, the purpose that you created us was to worship you. You saved us to worship you. The Son said, Lord God, that you are seeking such to worship you in spirit and truth. And so we praise you, Lord God, that we have the privilege of knowing you, having a relationship with you, that we can worship your holy name, Lord Jesus. Thank you for that. Thank you, Lord God, for your goodness and your greatness. Thank you, Lord God, for loving us with a love that we don't understand. We don't get it. We can't explain it. But your love is amazing. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving us in spite of us, for never changing your love for us, that even when we mess up, even when we don't add up, we don't, we don't live up, your love never changes. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. And we praise you, Lord God, because that's a, because of your character, because you are faithful and you cannot deny yourself. So we praise you for that. Lord, as we look now into opening the word and I pray that you would speak, Lord God, in a mighty way. We cry out for our brothers and sisters who are in Ukraine. We pray, Lord Jesus, for their health, their strength. We pray for wisdom, their protection. We cry out, Lord God, that people would come to know Jesus through this. And my prayer is, Lord God, that you would put an end to this war. That you'd meet the needs of the refugees. And Lord God, show us how we can help there. We trust you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. We are so glad that you are here this morning. Uh, praise team, thank you. Thank you for leading us in, in prayer. And, and, and you know what that really is? Our corporate worship is really an extension of our personal worship. So as we're worshiping God through the, through the week, we come and gather together and we're able to worship him together. And so it should be an extension of what's already going on in the week, right? That should be extension of that. So I've got a number of things I need to say. First of all, I, I want to say this. Uh, to our youth, uh, uh, Minister Josh and the youth group who, who led the service last week, I want to let you know you guys did a wonderful job. I was so proud of you guys. And so I just want to thank you. I really want to thank you for all those who participated. It, I, I was right on, right on, amen for that. Now, uh, next week, we have the privilege, and it's been two years, over two years, that we've done a first century communion. And so we are planning a first century communion next Sunday. It will be in the evening at 5 o'clock. Now, some people are maybe new or maybe you've forgotten what first century communion is. So let me just explain it to you real quick, okay? So in John chapter 13, we're given the picture of what happened the night that Jesus was betrayed. And he says there that he had a meal with his disciples. After he had a meal with the disciples, he got a, he got a towel and he began to clean their feet. He washed their feet. And then after that, he served them communion. So when we talk about first century communion, what we do, we just repeat what Jesus did. And so at 5 o'clock next, next Sunday, we want to invite you out. At 5 o'clock next Sunday, what we're going to do, uh, we'll come in for a meal. And so uh, we'll all be in the, in the fellowship hall, be at tables. We'll have a meal together. That's what Jesus did. He, they broke bread together. And then after the meal, somebody will explain what's going on. Somebody will be there talking about what's happening and why we do what we do. They'll give them a little more detail. Then at that time, we're going to split into rooms. And men are going to go into one room, and women are going to go into another room. And they're going to pair off with someone. And what's going to happen is, as, as we pair off, I'm going to pair off with someone. Uh, and so uh, if I pray off with, 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 uh, um, with, with Franz, okay, if I pray off with, with Franz, I'm going to wash his feet, and then he's going to wash my feet. And then we'll hug, we'll pray for one another, and then we'll be, in, we'll be in the room together, and someone will lead like a devotional, and people will be able to share testimonies, prayer requests, that kind of thing. And then after we do that, we'll go wash our hands, all right? Then we'll gather in here, and we'll actually take the bread and the cup. And we'll have a service here, and we'll sing some songs and that kind of thing. So that's the first church of communion. That's what Jesus did. They had a meal. He, 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 he washed their feet. 
and then he served them the communion. So we, 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 we replicate what, what Jesus did that night. So we want to invite you to come out. I want to say this to you. Even if you're saying, ah, I'm not into that foot thing. I'm not sure I could get that thing right. You don't need to do that. If you just come into the room and just watch, just say, you know, I'm, I'm not comfortable with that, but I just want to observe. I just want to come in and, and just observe what happens. And then participate, and you can participate in the, in, participate in the, in the conversation uh, after that. So uh, please, uh, next, next week at 5 o'clock, again, it's been three years since we've been able to do that. And we normally, as a church, we do it twice a year. We normally do it the Palm Sunday, and then we do it again in the fall. So uh, it is a great a great opportunity, a great ministry in doing that. So I think I've taken enough of our speakers, our speakers' time. So um, I had this list of things I was going to read to do the bio of the speaker, and he stopped me and he said, listen, just give me two sentences. You don't need to read all that. <laughs> okay. So I am going to try to summarize this really, really quick so we can get him up here and give him uh, the time. It's my pleasure. So James and Elizabeth Schaefer uh, began their, their ministry as in, in this church. And they were sent out as missionaries. They were missionaries for two and a half years in Mexico City. Uh, after which time, uh, after Pastor, Pastor Dixon talked with him, he became a chaplain in the reserves. And then he spent, in 1990, 1993, they were commissioned as missionaries from Grace Brethren Church to be missionaries in the military, and they work in chaplaincy. Uh, he served there for 28 years. Both of them served for 28 years, ministering uh, to, to, to soldiers, to families, uh, in every capacity. He's been all over the world. They've traveled all over the world. Um, for, so after retiring in 2019, James served Ambassador Sam Bron, Bronbach, Bronbach in the Office of Eternal Religious Freedoms at the U.S. Department of State. And he now, there, he's retired completely. Uh, he, they live, they're back in the Chesapeake District, and they're serving churches. They're invited to speak in different churches. They serve most of the time at the Waldorf Church, but he's open to serving everywhere. And so let me just say this. Uh, I have a great love for James and Elizabeth. They are dear people, not just to my, me personally, but to this church. And I know they love this church. They love the Lord most of all. And they are people who God greatly uses. And they have a love for God. So I'm not going to say anything else about him. Uh, I'm going I'm, 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 I'm to have him come on up. And uh, would you please with me welcome Chaplain James Schaefer. I, I know that was more than two sentences, wasn't it? That was more than two sentences, wasn't it? <laughs> I counted. <laughs> Did you, did, you, did you make sure your mic is on? Okay. All right. Okay. throughout the world for the sake of the gospel, and you're doing that here, and you're doing that there still. Praise God for you. I want to congratulate the Holy Spirit's work through you. So I also want to talk to you about containers. Actually, about a container ship. The Felicity Ace was one of those container ships that caught fire just this past month, and it burned out of control for a long time, and it drifted for days and days and days. And just this past month, it finally sank, losing almost a half a billion dollars of cargo of the cars that you had ordered, destined for the United States. 
drifted, drifted, and sank. And you say, well, is this a little unusual? Not necessarily for container ships. Is it unusual for people? Not necessarily for people either. You know, more common than the problems of world war, theft, avarice, corruption, is the unacknowledged, the unaddressed, the unspoken problem of drifting. Drifting from work, from responsibility, from productivity, drifting from the law, drifting from homes, and even drifting away from God. People drift, drift, drift away and sink. And it's human nature, I realize that. It's our human experience. Lives and souls drift, and we seem to do very, very little about it, if nothing at all. And it's like an anesthesia. It's like something that when people take, they drift away and they sink. Saying things like, well, I'll do something about it someday, whatever, whatever. You know, unless you're a confirmed drifter, most people want to know, what can I do? What can we do as people to stop the drift that has been going on in this world? And I think we need to ask ourselves, we need to ask others, two significant questions. Two central questions. What, what does drifting have? What are we drifting from? What are we drifting from? And the second question is, so what? What does drifting have to do with me? Well, I want you to look and see some of the answers from the scripture, from the book of Hebrews chapter 2. And if you would look in your copy of the scripture, I'm going to read from chapter 2 of the book of Hebrews from the New International Version, 1994, and beginning in verse 1. And listen along or follow in your copy, your mobile or your hard copy of the scriptures, Hebrews chapter 2. We must pay attention, therefore, to what we have heard so that we do not drift away. For if the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles. These are those things that happen at the resurrection, by the way. And by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. And those were the gifts distributed at the time after the resurrection of Pentecost. You know, as this season comes upon us where we're looking at Monday, Thursday, that is Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Palm Sunday, as your pastor just pointed out, Easter, the resurrection, you might rightly ask the question, what does drifting have to do with the resurrection and with Easter? And it is this, it is the solution that as we drifted, Christ died. Christ was resurrected. Confirmed his resurrection by infallible, infallible proofs. Destroyed death. Offered an anchor of eternal life to every soul upon this planet. And through the resurrection, not only life now, but life still to come. And so the purpose of what I'd like to share this morning is this, that the resurrection cracks open heaven. And heaven begins 
spilling out life upon this planet, upon this earth, upon people who don't even believe, and upon you who have placed your trust in Jesus Christ. And I want to say, it's only the beginning, because there is more still to come. Friends, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the central truth of the Christian faith. Without the resurrection, there is no faith. The resurrection answers what Job asked and the question that every human being will eventually have to answer. And when he said sooner or later that we will all have to answer this question, when he said this, or he asked this, if a person dies, will they live again? Well, you tell me. You tell me. What's the answer to that question? People have answered that question throughout the centuries. And they've answered it in a couple of phrases, a couple of phrases that they have repeated. So I'd like to do an exercise with us this morning. An exercise. When I say the phrase to answer that question, I want you to repeat a phrase after that. And this is the phrase, Christ is risen. And you respond by saying, He is risen indeed. So let me try this. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. It's a good question, and it's a good answer. But what is the resurrection? It is this, that Jesus Christ reversed death. The very law of entropy was ended, and Jesus Christ has now not only risen, but has given rising and risen life to each of us. This is this. Jesus Christ raised his own physical body. He said in John chapter 10, I have authority to lay down my life, and I have authority to pick it up again. It was foretold. Jesus foretold this, or excuse me, the scripture foretold this in the Bible. Jesus himself promised three days after his brutal crucifixion that he would rise again. It was witnessed by hundreds, hundreds of followers, politicians, even haters. Through the resurrection, Jesus became the captain of salvation. And all who receive him have not only eternal life now, but life still to come. You know, the resurrection was foreseen throughout the scripture. We read that the Lamb of God was slain from the foundation of the world. And we read the prophecy that the scripture states and foretells that the resurrection the resurrection will come where Jesus is not, the Messiah is not left to decay. The resurrection and the death of Christ are bound in the gospel. The resurrection blessings began spilling out from the plan of God from eternity or from time past, from the foundation of the world to today. The resurrection is Jesus Christ with us and pouring out the blessings of the resurrection today. I tell you, the resurrection changes all life. The resurrection must be applicable for now and for today. For if it is not, there's no resurrection in the future. If it's not changing and effective now, then there is no resurrection someday. You know, the resurrection does change all this world. So getting back to that first question, what are we drifting from? Now, I want to get to the point here because I know that eventually you need to get back to some of your plans, some of your blessings that you have in your home. Maybe you're actually pre 
pre-positioning your Easter bunnies to nibble on those Easter bunny ears. You're ready for Easter. <laughs> so I want to get to this point, and this is the answer. We, this world, have been drifting from the resurrection and so great a salvation. Listen to verse 1 again. We must pay attention, much closer attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Drifting away, the phrase means to flow right past the destination. It's like a leaf flowing down a stream effortlessly into a gutter. For centuries, people have drifted past the destination, the exit ramp from eternal danger and so great a salvation made by Christ's resurrection. Every mind, every heart has heard. Actually, the word literally is repeatedly heard of God's plea to run from death and its fears, to run to him and to eternal life. Every soul has had in their heart the longings for eternal life. Every person has heard of this in philosophy, in religion, in science, in relationships, in the arts, and even in the economy that continues to tell you that if you buy this, these products, these things, you'll live forever, you'll have things forever, the eternal, the forever warranty. Skeptics, skeptics have heard about the resurrection as well and can verify the proofs of the resurrection by the eyewitness accounts of followers, of the feckless, and of the fearful. There are more people who have provenly or have been verified in history who have seen the resurrection of Christ than were at the Declaration of Independence, than those who were at the inauguration of George Washington. The verification of the resurrection, even for the skeptic, is shown through historical fact, but that's not the problem. What's the problem? What are we drifting past? We're drifting past salvation. You know, the scripture says that it's just not any salvation. This is so vast, so great a salvation because Christ provided it for all sin, for all the universe, for all time, for all people. The resurrection is the final act of salvation. It changes lives now, changes lives to come, changes for eternity to come. The resurrection arrests drifting humanity and changes lives, our world now. It's cracking open heaven, opening a door, opening a channel, and opening up God's blessing on this life now. And not just the lives of those who believe, the resurrection has brought blessing to all people. As I will explain, salvation is even still to come. You know, the scripture says that the resurrection touches all life, all people, those who believe or not, because Jesus said it this way in John chapter 5. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves, all, will hear his voice. And come out, and those who have done what is good will rise to life, and those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. The resurrection touches all life, all humanity. The resurrection and salvation is so great so vast because all have access to it. Verse 3 of chapter 2 says this, 
how shall we escape? So great a salvation. And you notice it doesn't answer that rhetorical question because no one, no person will escape who says, well, I never heard that, or disregards, or is careless, or neglects so great a salvation. But friends, I want to say there's good news. And the good news is this, that no one escapes the blessings of the resurrection and salvation because all can have access to salvation. You know, it's interesting that the Apostle John put it this way in 1 John chapter 2. He said, He, Jesus Christ, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. God has cracked open heaven, revealed salvation blessings. All can have access to salvation now. Salvation is also so great because all can be changed now. This is not just, the resurrection is not just a postponed blessing someday. And as we prepare in our thinking for Palm Sunday, the passion of Christ, preparing for what the resurrection does to change us, but it also changes all of life because all can be changed now. It's not just postponed. It cracks open heaven, and this crack is widening. It's pouring out more. Can you begin to hear it? Salvation changes now. Remember the woman who knew that salvation was, is now in Luke chapter 7? She lived a sinful life. She came to Christ weeping, bearing ointment and her tears upon his feet, wiping them not only with tears, but with her own hair. And Jesus said to her, and said to others listening, and says throughout the centuries, her sins, her sins are many, and they have been forgiven. Friends, salvation is now. Remember the man who knows salvation is now in Mark chapter 5? He was the man who had an impure spirit, a demon, and Jesus said, come out! And in his right mind, he begged Jesus to remain with him. And Jesus Christ said, no. You go home and tell the, the people around you how the Lord has had mercy on you, and he did, and he did, and they were amazed because salvation is now. Remember you here, you who are listening, you remember how he has forgiven you. You remember what he has taken from you, the burden, and you know that salvation is now. But I, I, I must insist, for this world and for many, many souls, the problem still remains, that we're drifting. We're drifting right past so great a salvation. That brings me to the second question, or the second part, what is the problem? This is really what is happening. We're drifting past. We're ignoring what we have heard about so great a Savior. Who is the great Savior? He is Jesus Christ, God in the flesh. Turn back one page in your Bible or one page in your mobile device and look at Hebrews chapter 1, beginning verse 1, because it describes who is this Savior, who this world and many souls are drifting past. Hebrews chapter 1. And in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets and many times in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, 
through whom also the work that he made the universe, the sun, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Who is the Savior? He is God in the flesh. Jesus Christ, the Son referred to. What is the problem? The problem is we have drifted past the Savior and His salvation. He is the one who spoke to Philip in John chapter 14, the very Son in which he spoke in saying to Philip, he said, Philip, I have been with you all this time and you do not know me? Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? And the book of Colossians puts it this way in chapter 1. He is the image of the invisible God. And if you look in your Bible to the very last chapter, the very last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 5, we get a glimpse, we can see with our mind's eye who is this Son. Revelation chapter 5, beginning verse 11. And then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and ten thousand times ten thousands. They encircled the throne, and the living creatures, and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. This is who this world and many people are drifting past the Savior, the Son of God, God in the flesh, who has come, who has been resurrected, who from, etern from time past, from the foundation of the world, began the plan to change life, all of life, through his death and resurrection. And many souls drift past him, ignore salvation and the Savior and the resurrection life now and still to come. And so now I come to the second question that I asked you. The first question was, what are we drifting past? The second question is, so what? Any self-respecting drifter would ask herself or himself that question. What is it? What's the big deal? What am I drifting past? Well, I admit some may say, I'm drifted, I've drifted past salvation and the Savior. But what does that and the resurrection have to do with me? The so what is this. The so what is that he cares for this world. He cares for you. He cares for me. You see, the, the resurrection cracks open heaven and brings us safely to him and destroys the power of death and the fear attached to it and destroys what destroys us because he cares. He cares for us. How does he do it? Chapter 2, verse 10 says he brings us safely home now. Verse 10 says, bringing many sons and daughters to glory. This is what Jesus Christ did. So what? The resurrection and he, in his very act, brings and leads through that resurrection, whosoever will come to him. And safely home now. The word bring 
in the scripture does not mean that he forces or that he drags anyone. It means that he leads. He leads through going first to the cross and the first fruits, the first of the dead to rise, as had been the plan from the beginning. And he has already led people to glory at his resurrection because he cares. And he wants us to experience the life of heaven now and in this decaying world. For military types, some versions may say he led as the captain of salvation because he was the only substitution. He was the only sacrificial casualty to win the battle against death. And yet, he raised himself. Remember, he can lay down his life and he can take it up again. He raised himself as the military victor for us because he cares for us to be in glory with him. Of all the stories of heroism, of all the stories of sacrificial leaders, this one man outstrips them all. Christ, the captain, went to battle for us. He led us to victory. He cracked open heaven, and we have the resurrection life now, and yet more to come because he cares. I recently was talking with a young girl, my wife and I, during a good news club in southern St. Mary's County. She's had multiple dads. She's had, she has a troubled mom and a very difficult life. But I asked Zariah, I said, Zariah, who cares for you? And she quickly snapped to attention and she said, Jesus cares for me. You see, the resurrection brings us safely home now. And it's something that whether it be an 8-year-old or an 80-year-old can grasp that this is safety, that he brings us home safely now. You know, the, it's really important to notice, notice that he also destroys what destroys you now. Verses 14 and 15 of chapter 2 says this, Since therefore the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. So what? He cares by destroying what destroys you, destroying this world now. But someone may say, well, I don't see all the problems and the people and the power that are trying to destroy me or destroy my family. Ended. Verse 9 partly agrees with you. And listen to this. Verse 9 says, we do not yet see everything subject to him, but we do see Jesus. Everything is not subject to him because the final resurrection has not yet happened. It's still to come. But some things, some things are subject to him. Heaven is cracking open. People are longing for hope. The eternal is calling. People are being changed because salvation and the Savior are here now. And the fear of death can be replaced by hope of what is to come. How is that possible? Well, it's possible because he destroys what destroys you by making death ineffective. Ineffective. Who by faith come to Christ. The word destroys in the scripture here or break doesn't mean that he killed it. It means rather that it's ineffective. It's inoperable. It's like tyrants who are thrashing about today, this very day, as our pastor wisely prayed, who are hurting millions upon millions, 
who are still causing great fear. But in the end, they're ineffective. They're ineffective. Christ raised himself from the dead, and he made death ineffective, releases from slavery to death those who come to him. How does he do it? He replaces the fear of death with hope and the change of a resurrection life now and still to come. A commander in the army once said to me, and this is as we were preparing for, we were training for battle, and he said, Chaplain, hope is not a plan. And I responded, Sir, that's because you haven't been to combat. Friends, hope can save. Hope is effective. I have been to battle in Afghanistan, and I saw many, many soldiers, sailor, airmen, marines die around me, and many Afghans. What gave me hope in battle was returning home to see my sweetheart, and also the hope of heaven if I would not come home to see her. Friends, hope saves. Hope is effective. The resurre resurrection is tangible hope and life now and life still to come. So are we in this world still not sure? Are we still not sure of what this resurrection means? Well, this leads me to another question, one that I didn't tell you I was going to ask. It's a third question. The first question was, what are we drifting past? We're drifting past what we have heard, what this world has heard about salvation and so great a Savior and drifting right past the rescue, the exit from eternal danger. That's what. The second question was, so what? So what? Well, the so what is this? He cares. He cares for us. He cares for you and me to bring to glory. And he destroys what destroys us now. So that leads to the third question. Now what? Now what? Answer this. Answer the original question, verse 3. How shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation. So friends, the good news is this, and I like to try to do this because those chocolate bunny ears are melting. The good news is this, we can't escape. We cannot escape so great a salvation. And the blessing and the hope of change of the resurrection are with us now and the final resurrection still to come. You know this from the facts that Christ rose from the dead. The resurrection was proven by eyewitnesses, the facts of hundreds of testimonies. The resurrection has whet the appetite for second chances and lives and a world that can change heart by heart. We cannot escape we cannot escape the blessings of the resurrection. Can you hear the empty tomb? Can you hear the lives being changed? Can you hear heaven cracking open? But we must also answer the question, how shall we escape? How shall we escape? and acknowledge that we cannot escape. We've been drifting from the resurrection. We've heard, and we must account for so great salvation and so great a Savior. Christian or non-Christian, those who are listening, can you hear the silence in the court, the silence of our deserved accusation? So now what? Now what about us? Christian, and this may apply to some of us here. Are you drifting? If the resurrection changes life now, are you, am I 
changed. If not, I, we must give our life back to living for Christ. For the resurrection is now. It's not just someday. It is now. Non-Christian, have you been drifting? You've heard that God provides salvation. Lash your life. Lash it to the only Savior who rescues all life. For what a rescue God will give that person now. An eternal life to come. The final resurrection. Everyone, anyone, whosoever will, can do three things. These three things. First, recall, recall the salvation and the Savior that have been given. Refresh, refresh my life, your life daily in the Word of God. Spend time listening, hearing, discipline your heart to hear Him speak. Refresh yourself, recall salvation and the Savior. Secondly, receive the gifts Receive those gifts that he has already provided to this world, bringing you to glory and destroying what destroys you. The third is this, reactivate. By faith now in Jesus Christ as Savior, by faith, renew your life in this resurrection life now and the life still to come. You know, the resurrection demands a decision as it confronts the eternal decision, resurrection shows that tomorrow has met today. The resurrection is now. The life of the resurrection still to come is offered to us here and now. Heaven has cracked open. The blessings of heaven are pouring out from the plan of God from the foundation of the world, and it continues to pour out on this earth. And it has, as it were, kissed the earth. Now what are we to do? There's only really one thing we can do. And I say this to Christians as well as to non-Christians. Repent. Turn to Him. Because that's what the word repent means. It's not difficult to turn to Him. And if it is today that you turn to him and say, yes, Lord, I turn to you again. This is good. This is good. And if it is for the first time, it is good as well. And receive the good news because the resurrection is now and is still to come. So I said to you towards the beginning that the purpose of what I wanted to share was that the resurrection cracks open heaven. And it begins spilling out life now and still to come. And it's only the beginning because more is still to come. Do you also remember the exercise that we did here? Remember the words that we spoke? I would like you to ask, or I'd ask you to stand with me, if you will, please. And as I repeat the, say the phrase, you repeat the phrase that you know. Friends, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And Lord Jesus, I ask your goodness and your blessing, the resurrection blessing upon this family as we prepare for this season that we focus on how you are leading us to live a resurrection life and a life still to come yet and that we bring and encourage and minister through this church and through these loving families and pastors to bring many souls to you, for the life is now and still to come. And we pray and thank you in Jesus' name, and we all answer by saying, Amen. Please be seated.